fact, this is, he was extremely lucky. He broke C7, which is the sticky vertebra at the back of your neck there. The arrow actually isn't in him, sometimes as much as I, I'd like to put it in. Um, so he was incredibly lucky. He had um, three hospitals, a neck reconstruction, and six months in hospital. And this is age 17. Um, maybe some of you recently, maybe some of you in the future more than likely, and maybe some of you in the past have had a moment where there's been a, a family bereavement, something in your life has changed, whether you lost your job, and suddenly the morning before seemed very different to the now. And that's exactly how we felt. We'd grown up doing sport together, very, very kind of tight bond as twins. I know some twins um, go apart, but we stayed very close. And now there wasn't that sport to keep us together. Um, and that was really weird. So I went off to university, I started playing semi-professional rugby, and then I snapped my leg and had to stop playing. And I guess the funny thing is, a small door opens up into a big room. It was, I wouldn't say fate, and I wouldn't say someone up there is going, yeah, this is you know, what you're going to be doing, but it definitely seemed right to go, right, what do we do after this? Well, you had that very 19th century stuff, thinking this is going to be easy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and we, I don't know whether anyone's been to Greenland. We arrive over this um, glacial scree, and instantly, instantly, there is the biggest 80-meter wall of ice you have ever seen from the Russell Glacier. I've got goosebumps thinking about it. I just remember thinking, what have we done? These experiences um, are very hard to convey. It's like describing the color red. It's a bit like orange, but a little bit like brown. It's your own experience. You might be seeing something totally different. And that's exactly what it's like. Until you experience it and go on a trip yourself, it's really hard to describe. Um, but instantly, we're met with this um, the glacier. So it's about four or five days through all of this um, undulating terrain. Within the high peaks and low peaks, you've got moulins where, in the summer, all the ice melted, flows down and just plunges straight down. I'm sure we've seen some of the images on BBC Planet, where all the water just goes into the abyss. And we had to watch out. I think there's one over here. It's called a Moulin. Um, so we had to make our way all the way over the high points. But as you can see, it's very, very, very hard ice. And we've got huge pulks. What do you do? So one of us would go on one side, and the pulk would be the counterweight the other side. And these big pulks here, as you can see, are very high, but quite short. And they rolled the whole time. George, who was our polar guide at the time, you'll see a picture later. Um, these two are rolling along, rolling along, and this polk is pounding away, slipping and sliding, and I'm there with this huge thing about to start going, oh my god. It didn't roll once. Never rolled. And instantly, I had this positive feeling going, actually, what, what people are saying, because it's never been done before, you know, oh, that's going to be terrible. Look, it's nine feet of wooden magnificence, and this one's just light carbon fiber. That one's going to be much better. But the old, particularly in the first 10 days, was fantastic, so much better. So yeah, I was wearing wooden skis as well, um, bamboo poles. I had this, it was an okay harness, a little bit of hessian rope. Um, my pulk was about 100 kilos, 80 to 100 kilos. We didn't have scales in Greenland, so we couldn't tell. And Hugo's was about 40 to 50. I so, think it was a little more than that. Come on. 40 to 50 grams. Come on. Let's um, and Hugo was wearing the modern equivalent, so carbon fiber skis, carbon fiber poles, and the usual polar outfit, shoes rated down to minus 121. I'm there in leather shoes. And I think from the outset, we knew it was going to be tough. But it wasn't until we got to um, the top of the glacier. I don't know whether you can see, you can't really see it, but just above us, you can see the far mountains in the distance, and that's kind of where we started. And this is what they call a Borgstrand. A Borgstrand is where the ice cap first breaks off and then goes down into the Russell Glacier. Um, and we'd skied right over the top. And it was a real moment of, right, let's put our polar training into action. We'd done a course in Chamonix to um, rescue people out of crevasses. <laughs> Instantly thought, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's put ourselves down this hole. <laughs> we have no idea what we're doing. It'd be a great rehearsal, you know, make some great footage. And actually, the experience had taught us that best not to, especially after the first couple of days. So we've skied over this. And this side is now what they call the Greenland Ice Sheet. So it goes up to 13,500 feet, 3,500 meters. It's really, really high. So perfect dome all the way up and then all the way down. So, and, it's, and it was one of those moments where I did start to believe in the kit. The skis were really good. The pulk, particularly, was 
fantastic. I could walk the pulk, even though it was nearly double the weight. I could pull it and then walk with it, and it just slid. Whereas the small pulk, because it had much, much smaller feet, pulled, stop, instantly stopped. So the guys were having to pull the whole time. I actually ended up having to slow my pulk down on a couple of downhill sections, which is annoying, because I wish we'd got to the other side, which I'll come to, because then I would have just toboggan and you guys would have walked. Um, so apart from the clothing, which was fantastic, and we were finding so much new, wonderful stuff about it, we also did the food. So when Shackleton went back to Antarctica in 1907, um, he obviously took a huge amount of food. Um, we didn't take any alcohol, but we did take um, fat, oats, and cured meat. And that was my main kind of broth soup for the day. And then I also had Garibaldi biscuits and ginger nuts. Whereas Hugo and George Bullard, our polar guide, were eating the latest and best modern lightweight foods. To put that into context, a tin of mixed vegetables is 49 calories and weighs 400 grams. I was carrying 18 of those. I'm going to do the math. That's not a lot of calories. But it's basically the same as just one of those packets. So every time the boys were tucking into yummy food, Snickers, Mars bars, I was there with my, my fat. And I was literally just eating fat with a spoon because it was delicious. No, the, the science was fantastic. And we had to take blood glucose, which is actually really, really difficult in cold environments. You know, I don't know whether any of you are diabetic or take blood pricks regularly, but it's actually quite hard to take blood normally. At minus 40, which it got down to, there is no blood in the fingers. So we're really having to kind of work our way up to find any blood. In short, through the two weeks that we had on the Greenland ice cap, the modern food, as we all know, is quite high in sugar and carbohydrates. Don't mind me. And it goes like this. Up, energy, low, energy, up, down. And the graph, which we don't have here at the moment, it's all on our website if you want to go and see it. Um, Hugo's graph was very much like a, like a sound wave, whereas mine, amazingly, was very, very smooth. And that was because it didn't have high sugar and it had high fat and protein. And it kind of goes to show that, you know, the more we learn about ourselves, the more we can understand and adapt food. And that's exactly what we do on our, our trips now, is we add far more fat, far more protein and less sugar. It keeps you more satiated, you feel better. It's actually less dangerous. You do make some really bad judgment calls when you're very, very low in sugar. Hugo got down to 2.8. That's hypoglycemic coma, and we actually got a warning from the medical doctors at King's College London because it got so low. Um, so that was amazing to know that Shackleton's food back then is probably, to be honest, we both agreed, better than it is today. So this is George on the left. He's our triplet, born literally two hours older than us. Um, and this is just an example of um, what fur does. A lot of people in kind of high street fashion, you know, fur is fantastic. Whether it's real or not, that's up to you. But particularly in a polar environment, fur is absolutely vital. If you've got fake fur, it's not going to work. The real fur keeps a warm pocket of air by your face. And that's why Hugo's eyelashes, George, if he had his goggles off, that's why it's frost free. I didn't. I've got snow and ice on my eyelashes. I've got it on my skin, and I'm starting to get frostbite on my face. I didn't know this until we looked at the pictures afterwards. But it took about an hour to defrost my balaclava off my beard. This is actually stuck like that because of the wind. Um, and this was really, really cold. Um, and this is where we started to realize the limitations of the old kit. The food was fine, but the limitations of the old kit. All we were wearing underneath was a, a thin shirt a jumper, I don't know whether anyone's wearing a jumper in here, and then just layering it up. Minus 40, two jumpers, two thinner jumpers and a t-shirt were not doing the trick. I only had the leather boots that I had, pretty much these. And after about two minutes of standing still, they were frozen solid. And so at this point, we started considering wearing modern equivalent. I mean, because we're not polar explorers professionally, and this is our first trip we've done, it would have been unbelievably naive of us to go into this environment going, yeah, we'll be fine, we don't need to take any spares. We always take spares just in case things go wrong. Shoes, goggles, gloves, the most important thing, and a big down jacket through my knee. And over the two weeks that we were spending from, we spent from Kangalusak to Dai Tu, Hugo's knee became unbelievably sore and painful. And unfortunately, we had to actually get helicoptered off the, uh, the ice cap. When we had this decision to make, it was unbelievable. We had a huge amount of money behind us, a lot of sponsors, 
And it was only our second expedition. You know, the repercussions of that is going back to London, going, we rode across the Atlantic like lots of other people did, and then we tried to be polar explorers, and that failed. How can you get money from somebody? And I think the biggest um, lesson learned was from a guy the year before on Greenland, actually, a very sad a guy called Philip Docker Eve. You might have seen him in the paper. He froze to death um, the other side of the ice cap in minus 72. And that's a classic example of you can always come back. They pushed the boundaries too much. They found the edge, and unfortunately, he died. And that was in our minds the whole time across this. And we had sponsors on one phone, and we just had, look, we're in minus 40. The whole um, system we had designed was with three people, so the tent, cooking, etc. for me to then take George Bullard's, our guide's life, in my hands. Hugo gets helicoptered back, and we carry on. It wasn't, wasn't kind of even remotely thought about. So it was an unbelievably difficult decision, and one that we still have got nowhere near in terms of what it meant, um, the implications. Um, and this is the helicopter. Um, amazingly, we had about 13 hours of satellite phone calls with insurance companies and doctors all over the world saying, yes, they need medical evacuation. Helicopter comes from Nuuk, which is 200 miles south of Kangalusak. It comes up the coast and then comes up to us. And we see it flying off in the distance. And we're like, oh, OK, cool. So we set off some flares. And it turns around, lands, and we chat to the helicopter pilot. We're like, well, why did you go wrong? He goes, well, nobody's ever been picked up from Dai 2 radar station since it was abandoned in 88, and it's drifted 11 miles. <laughs> so he went to the original coordinates of where it was. Um, but just to, show, just to goes to show, kind of, you can't plan for these things. And <laughs> luckily, the Polk only just fitted into the helicopter as well. Um, it was a very um, sad time for us, but also, you know, I think the greatest lesson we learned is we can come back and do it again, and that's what we are doing in 2020. Um, George Manley here and his climbing party, but the key one there is Sandy Irvine. They disappeared at making the summit attempt on, uh, in 1924, and it's really split the climbing community. Lots of people think he, they made it, lots of people don't. I mean, understandably, they didn't survive, so arguably lots of people say that that was an unsuccessful, but I would like to think he did. So we decided that we would go and test the kit and equipment used by George Mallory. And a lot of the polar kit used in uh, the early days was actually used by mountaineers because you know, people weren't developing it. It wasn't mass market. It wasn't, you know, nobody was pouring money into these. So it was very much a Heath Robinson, try it your own, see what happens, frozen to wear the old kit. Now, I was really, really glad that I didn't wear the old kit in green because I, in the warm kit, still struggled. Now, it was a very different mindset to going in this trip because I suddenly had to think, this is going to be horrendous. This is going to be awful. I'm not going to enjoy it. Rossi's there going to be kind of floating up the mountain and having fun, and I'm just going to be horrible. Anyway, that was all kind of suppressed quite quickly. We went in for some testing. We had internal uh, thermometers and all sorts of stuff over us, so internally, externally. They were monitoring all our kit. So, you know, again, all traditional materials, uh, wool, um, jumpers, woolen, or plus fours, everything was natural. I lasted 20 minutes. My skin temperature from the tests, that reduced by two degrees. They were pretty happy with that. Ross then decides to walk in with um, some modern mountaineering clothing, was taken out within eight minutes because his skin temperature dropped by six degrees. So it was really, so then, you know, that, that's something that we just didn't expect to happen. And okay, we, you know, we could argue that we were wearing the systems wrong or layering, or Rossi's just an amateur climber, which is probably more the case. But that was a really, really nice comfort feeling for me because I was just going, oh, glad that was all right. In Russia, in the Caucasus Mountains, all you've got is wind, wind, wind. I was wearing just a silk shirt, which, which did me pretty well up to about 4,000 meters, whereas Ross in the old and the new stuff was changing kit left, right, and center. I found the old stuff immediately much, much better. Very, very different mindset. It was a completely different trip to Greenland, admittedly, but my mindset completely changed. I think there's an air of um, arrogance having all the best kit because people think that they can just, oh, if I can pay to go on Everest or Antarctica, you know, we probably fall into that category. You know, we, we like to have the best kit possible that you get a bit blasé about it. And that's one thing actually kind of stripping down those elements to the old kit it takes away. It's actually, it's you and the mountain, not you and the kit and everything. It makes it a lot more raw and connected. 
as we were rising up and the sun was coming up, we had this massive thundercloud coming up and chasing us with thunder and lightning. And we thought, oh, you know, the pressure was on of that failure. We really, really, really didn't want to fail. And so we got up to this lens rock, which is where we've been acclimatizing. And because of the other, I'm going to blame the others, they were so slow that I couldn't generate enough body heat for my feet. So I made it to 5,000 meters in my leather boots, which, which I think if it had just been us, I would have gone the whole way, 100% gone the whole way. But it was, it was really, really interesting knowing that, you know, we didn't know that if you go slower, you, you're not as hot and things like that. Altitude, at altitude, your body really, really struggles to keep its heat. So sadly and annoyingly, we had to change our boots. But from then on to the top, which was another 800 meters, was the hardest thing we have ever done in our lives, even today. Um, and it's odd, the one thing that was pushing us up that mountain, other than a thunderstorm and the loom of failure, was failure itself. I honestly think, had we have succeeded in Greenham, we would have failed on this trip, because there was a moment where we both looked at each other and we said, I'm absolutely done. Like We had absolutely no, like, we had about, because of the Russian catering, we had about 500 calories a day for the whole trip, so we were on empty. And we both looked at each other, and we were probably in height-wise only um, three, 400 meters, but another two, three hours of climbing, and we just said to each other, if somebody goes, we're going, that's me done. But it was that failure, we could not fail. And you know, I think lots of people look at failure very, very negatively. And you know, oh, you failed at that. I think it's brilliant. The, 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 the more you fail, the more you learn, frankly. You know. The old kit, I'm gonna say, is as good as the new. There's, there's really not, and it's obviously user discretion on how you use it, etc. cetera. Um, but I really, really do think that you get the traditional materials, get, you know, know what works in your kit. And yeah, I, was, I think we're, we can both say that the old kit's as good as the new. I mean, yeah. obviously, in England, you're going to need a rain jacket, aren't you? So I'd probably go new on that. But, you know, from the science, et cetera, they're very, very even. I mean, you look like an idiot, <laughs> but you feel like a hero. Um,